welcome to our channel. Um, so today we have some interesting discussion around gender. Gender equality, as we all know, is not a new concept. It does not need an introduction as such. But uh, over the years, uh, so many people and so many organizations are working towards understanding this concept and also developing methods to achieve gender equality. Somewhere down the line, I also feel that in our uh, you know, approach, in our work, we have also ended up uh, somewhere down the line defining or giving meaning to gender roles, to also uh, the way we all react to a particular gender, let's say even having meaning to masculinity or femininity. And uh, sometimes we also then end up having misconstrued understanding or misrepresented understanding of these terms also. So I think it's very important that we have some discussion around that and uh, gender stereotyping also something that's become very common. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure today and an honor uh, for me to introduce you to uh, Mr. Juan Pablo Ramirez Miranda. Uh, he is a part of UNESCO. Uh, UNESCO, as you all know, stands for the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. He joined UNESCO in 2012. Uh, currently, he is serving there as the head of social and human sciences. Um, and uh, this is in the New Delhi cluster office. He's been supporting the implementation of UNESCO's mandate on areas of social inclusion, youth, sports, gender equality. And uh, he's working uh, you know, in several countries uh, and their development like uh, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, the Maldives, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Uh, in the field, he has also served in Vietnam and Costa Rica, uh, respectively, as an educative, uh, as an uh, executive officer to the uh, director and implementing programs related to education, social inclusion, human rights, gender equality, youth, and the rights and empowerment of people of African descent. So he comes with a diverse you know, experience and uh, UNESCO's work with respect to gender, gender equality, and also some of the challenges they have faced, the research that they have seen. Uh, we thought that it will be very interesting to hear from him. So without taking any more time, Juan, I think I uh, hand it over to you. If we could understand, you know, the work that you've been doing broadly so far first and then get into uh, further discussion. Yes, thank you so much, Ivan. It's very, very nice to have this dialogue on, on such an important issue, uh, particularly with someone as committed as you to, to the empowerment of women, to gender equality, and to protecting women's rights. Uh, of course, um, I mean, I have been uh, in India only briefly for, for some almost two years, but it has been um, uh, a very welcoming country. I've been delighted to work here and particularly to be with UNESCO to address uh, something as important as youth empowerment, uh, the issues related to sports for development and empowerment, and of course, uh, gender equality and inclusion on a broader perspective, particularly on issues related to, to persons with disabilities. Uh, India has uh, transformed itself very rapidly and um, in such a large and diverse country, there are large and diverse challenges to address. And we are delighted to work hand in hand, not only with the government, but with partners at the grassroots levels, with academia, with civil society, with a lot of uh, counterparts that we call uh, the UNESCO family and others to uh, join with uh, the government and the people of India in, in this path towards sustainable development and sustained peace. Wow. And as far as, uh, you know, gender itself is concerned, uh, I understand that you do a lot of uh, research around that as well. And how has your experience been there? Yes. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, we are celebrating this week the 75 years of the United Nations. Uh, UNESCO was born one year later, so for us next year we will celebrate uh, 75 years, but uh, number one, the world has transformed itself a lot over the past 75 years. We have never ceased to be an ever-evolving organization. Uh, and uh, at some point when it comes to gender equality, our message is very clear. Uh, women and men must enjoy equal opportunities, choices, capabilities, power and knowledge as equal systems. 
Uh, and that is why since 2007, uh, our member states, that is uh, basically 193 countries in the planet, uh, that come together every two years for a general conference to decide on our program and our priorities. Since 2007, they decided that gender equality would be a global priority for UNESCO, that everything we do, that all our actions, all our programs need to uh, include gender considerations, need to mainstream gender as part of our programming, and need to strive for being gender transformative and contributing to the empowerment um, of, uh, of women. In general, we uh, want to ensure that this is reflected all across the board in our policies, programs, processes, so that it's advanced uh, not only um, in our internal processes, but also uh, on our work on the ground across the network of uh, somewhere over 50 field offices that we have across the world. Uh, and basically, we have, uh, as I was saying, a, a large network of what we call UNESCO chairs in universities. We have some networks who carry out work as related as research, training, advocacy regarding gender related matters. But of course, this involves working with youth, work addressing the issue of gender based violence, uh, working on issues, as you said, UNESCO's educational, scientific, and cultural organization of the UN. We work on education of girls and women. On, uh, and women on comprehensive sexuality education because reproductive and sexual rights are very important on the issues of communication and training journalists on uh, addressing gender stereotypes in the media uh, and how to communicate on gender-based violence because it's uh, always very important for the media to uh, acknowledge their responsibility and their needs uh, to communicate this with, uh, with the right approach. And then, of course, we work also on, on issues related to women's rights, uh, democracy, and women's political and economical participation, uh, et cetera. I mean, UNESCO has developed various guidelines and tools for gender equality, and, and usually they provide roadmaps, recommendations for gender mainstreaming, and like for the full integration of gender equality considerations into education, sciences, culture, communication, and, and the media. Right. Uh, uh, so I think as you rightly mentioned that you know gender equality has been uh, in the agenda for a long time. And uh, in your experience, when you see the different needs of different genders, so women being one category of you know uh, the wide variety of genders, uh, do you see actually that they do have probably different needs and? then how do you bring everyone on the same page as far as equality is concerned? And then are we really talking about equality or equity? If you could throw some light on that. Thank you very much. That's, that's extremely important because of course, uh, you know, sometimes this type of debates uh, go around uh, definitions and terminologies, et cetera. And I know that uh, for legal, from the legal perspective, of course, uh, the terminology is extremely important. From our perspective, of course, we have defined our global priority as gender equality, which means uh, that we want to achieve a society with where uh, men and women are treated equally. But of course, what we are saying is that, uh, and what, what for us means gender equity, is fairness in the treatment for men and women according to their respective needs. And that is even with, if we're striving to equality, it is with an equity perspective, that means responding to each one's respective needs that we can fully achieve that equality. So for us, this distinction between equality and equity is that equity is taking care of the uh, specific needs that would include equal treatment or a treatment that is different, but which is considered equivalent in terms of rights, mm -hmm. benefits, obligations, and opportunities. So again, gender equity is what sets the stage for gender equality. Thank you so much. I think that really helps. Uh, sometimes, you know, you also mentioned that you are working with a lot of youth to, uh, you know, really make a change in the society. And I think we also firmly believe that uh, unless the youth is involved, 
it's really difficult to bring about any uh, change at all. Uh, so on, on that um, aspect, how are you engaging with the youth of the country? Uh, I mean, first, on the perspective on how we address this issue, I, I want to complement what I, was, what I was saying in terms of equity with uh, a very important concept of uh, intersectionality. When we address the issues of gender equality, it's uh, very important to have the awareness of like the distinctions within social identities that affect opportunities, because that is also very important for us to achieve gender equality. Equity means leveling the playing field, but intersectionality will allow us to understand how the differences in lived experiences, historical and cultural conditions of different women and men will help us to understand and decode the barriers that would allow us to expand equity. Of course, it is not the same thing to be born uh, a privileged uh, man from Mexico than to be born uh, a woman in uh, India, in Uttar Pradesh, in uh, specific conditions related to class and caste uh, and other social considerations and access to education. And it's not the same if it was maybe the same woman in Mexico, a different context, a different country. Uh, we always need to consider all of these different aspects to understand the, again, the historical and cultural conditions that are specific to the inequalities and barriers that someone is facing. In terms uh, of uh, addressing uh, the needs related specifically to youth that you are mentioning, of course, um, we, through our wide, wide network of partners from the civil society, we spread our messages so far and wide. And equality, it's equally important that we bring the voices of youth to support these initiatives. So our perspective on our work with young women and men in general is that they have to be uh, equal partners and they need to have a seat on the table of the discussion. And that is one example of how our mainstreaming of our gender equality priority um, is also contributing to, to uh, women empowerment as a whole across our program. So our work with youth is uh, completely related to this. Obviously, uh, talking about young people and in not only uh, youth, but also uh, boys and girls, uh, and being an agency particularly focused on education, it's always important to say that uh, the world of the future and the societies of the future begin with education. And something as specific as gender equality uh, that requires such a big transformative approach for our society can obviously be enhanced uh, through education. As UNESCO, we are very pleased to see the groundbreaking National Education Policy 2020 uh, recently launched in India that includes considerations for gender equality. Of course, the challenge not only in India, but for any country is to bring about change uh, from what is there on paper on our legal frameworks into the ground, into reality, into transforming uh, the lives of uh, all of these young women and girls that require uh, a new approach for, for uh, achieving a more equal and, and a gender equal society specifically. And that is why we work hand in hand uh, with the government, with our partners to ensure uh, their ideals and their aspirations as contained in this type of policies uh, become more and more in reality. No, of course, this is uh, uh, like in many aspects of our, of our life, of our work, uh, a work that it's uh, almost never ending. No, we, we always live in a perfectible society, particularly in issues related to human rights, and even more so on issues related to women rights, because of course uh, we are uh, facing just like inequality, just, just like the way uh, we have in, uh, included in our societies, I don't know, people uh, living in poverty or people living with functional diversity or disabilities, we need to change our perspective. When there's exclusion, we need to completely change our systems to ensure all of these oppressions that may come from uh, our history or colonialism or our economic system are lifted 
so everyone can come together and as we say in the sustainable development goals 2030 agenda of the united nations ensure that no one is left behind yes i think that's uh, one of the most beautiful phrases i've heard uh, you know uh, in a long time no one should be left behind and that's the beauty of it and that's that's where inclusion Comes it, in, so. Exactly. It's a very wise principle, Shivangi, that our member states gave us. They, they came together. I was looking at this beautiful video of the celebration of the United Nations 75 years yesterday that everyone uh, can find on YouTube for free. It's called Nations United. And, uh, and indeed, the history of the United Nations has led to this moment in 2015 where 197 countries in the planet came together to agree on a path for peace and sustainable development. And the, the three main principles that they agreed upon for this agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals, is universality. That this is not about developed or, or developing countries. This is not about one aspect or another aspect of our society. We live all together in one planet, and that is why uh, we need to all, at all levels, take care of uh, our aspirations for peace and sustainable development. Number two, uh, the principle of um, indivisibility. This is, I mean, you know about human rights, you know that these two principles are also part of the, the Universal Declarations of Human Rights. But in the 2030 agenda, indivisibility means that all of these 17 sustainable development goals cannot be separated because if you achieve poverty, uh, er the eradication of poverty without fighting climate change, there's no planet for these people out of poverty to live in. If you achieve um, sustainable management of our oceans, uh, but there's no peace, people cannot benefit from uh, a harmonic interaction with our oceans. And the third principle is exactly leaving no one behind. And it done, in that sense, it was extremely important that there is one specific goal devoted to gender equality. Sustainable Development Goal 5 is, um, has set the, obje the objective of all of us achieving gender equality by 2030 uh, at all levels, no? not only representation in the public space, but also ensuring girls' education uh, all across the planet, uh, eradicating violence against women, all of these uh, necessary changes that we need to achieve. Of course, this is the most ambitious agenda in the history of humankind, and all reports are saying that even before the pandemic, we were not uh, on track to achieve them. Now the pandemic, of course, is like the uh, most disrupting event in our, in our lives, in, our, in the history in the recent history of the world, in, in the lives of most of us who have been live, who are living today. Uh, and this will, of course, imply uh, going a little bit back in what we had achieved on the sustainable development goals. But, of, but the important thing is that we have, we have an agreed roadmap that was signed off by all countries on the planet. So civil society can join, can ask their government to like stand for their commitments that they made and um, by 2030 we will have achieved some there will be some work left for sure but we can continue to strive towards these ideals yeah certainly certainly so um, actually thank you for giving us that background as well and that really helps and and especially the way that you said that you know if we achieve certain aspects and we don't achieve the rest ultimately there is going to be no no benefit, no harmony at all. So I think that, that's a great takeaway for me as well. And Shivani, like when we talk about gender equality, it's just pure logic. How can we consider that we have arrived somewhere as humanity if we are leaving behind 50% of the world's population? Because like there's a moment where we need that realization at all levels to, to understand that, that moving forward, needs to include all of us working together towards gender equality. Absolutely. Uh, you know, when you were explaining this, um, uh, the, the entire work that's happening around this subject, naturally there would be a lot of men, women, you know, people of all genders and probably sexualities uh, working towards achieving the goal. Um, and 
in our experience, whatever work we've been doing, we do come across a lot of situations where women say that, uh, you know, it's difficult for men to understand the difficulties we face. So I think my question to you is that, you know, with, with the wide variety of partners that you have in the work that you're doing, uh, I'm sure this is, this is just one of the mindsets. There could be so many more thoughts and challenges as well uh, that people have. So how do you, you know, cross these hurdles and then ultimately reach closer towards the goal that you have set? Yes, indeed. I mean, for when when I was thinking about uh, your question, of course, I think of this famous poem of, of Hasif uh, Hafiz Ibrahim that says that a woman is a school. If you teach her, you teach an entire generation. I have heard that a lot in India. It's something very ingrained in people's minds. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, gender inequality is a matter of concern for everyone. So uh, how can our economy develop if uh, this part of, uh, of our population is left out as a resource, as I was saying? How can we make sound policies for everyone when one part of the population is kept out of decision making, particularly in policies that, that concern them? If a policy, if a rule, if a law is made without taking into consideration the specific needs of women, it's, it means that they are not um, fully uh, encompassing the needs of everyone that is concerned because uh, most, of, most of our laws, of our rules are uh, targeting everyone. No? When we look at gender equality from a rights-based approach, of course, this provides the legal framework to hold people accountable. And so it is important to know, to note that law doesn't always defend women's uh, liberties. For example, girls may have the right to free and compulsory, compulsory education, but they fail, they usually face also social obstacles that restrict their capabilities and hinder them from exercising this right. So uh, again, an awareness on the intersectionality and the needs from policy to practice is very important to address these barriers. The conversations in general that we are having uh, around gender equality uh, are very important, but there's something that it's very, uh, that for me is, is missing, and this relates very much to your question on, on men not understanding the, the reality and, and not necessarily the, only the needs faced by women, but the, the I, I don't like using a strong word, but it's the oppression faced by women due to all of these inequalities in many contexts. So we need to bring more men into the conversation. That is something uh, usually missing for, from the areas of gender equality. Of course, it is natural that, that resources devoted to gender equality will go directly for, for women's empowerment. And it's natural that uh, women defend their own rights. But of course, women need to understand and need to come into the conversation and open up spaces for dialogue so that gender equality is looked as an opportunity for development of all rather than just a controversial social issue. So uh, as, as we were saying, uh, gender equality doesn't mean men and women should be considered equals. No, no one is equal. In this world, we are all different persons. We have all our individuality. We live in a, in a society with certain collective narratives, with certain uh, collective dynamics, but of course, the gender equality means that no one is treated different just because they are men, women, uh, or else. And in general, um, we need to, to create spaces for dialogue for people to understand this, because this is not about, uh, of course, in, in the end, this is about changing dynamics of, powers, but, of power, but this is not about uh, now women oppressing men. No, no one is talking about that. So that is, that is very important to clarify, because uh, this, this can be, of course, uh, sometimes a, a, a difficult discourse to approach, particularly in certain social, cultural contexts, but, but we need to understand. Once, once it's explained like this, like you and I are talking, it is not such a, a, a controversial thing. It's simply revolutionary in the sense that it's a, a, a transformation of our society. But this is not something that um, will... Uh, radically affect anyone when it's achieved. It's only positive in, in terms of its outcome. So basically, we, as UNESCO, I wanted to, to share with you that we do have an initiative on engaging men's and, men and boys for gender equality, providing a, a range of tools like advocacy, capacity building, and research. 
We, for example, here in India, we have worked with a, a partner um, from uh, Pune called the Equal Economic, uh, Community Foundation, working to train educators in schools and uh, train them on how to mainstream uh, boys for gender equality through educational interventions in schools. So we have rolled out a, a, a pilot program that has reached out uh, some schools, some 150 teachers that in turn have trained like uh, the target is like 6,000 boys and their response is impressive. They change their approach. They think, uh, for example, in our tests that we do by the end of the training, they, they feel that they have the same right to an education that their sisters. Whereas in the beginning, maybe they, they have this ingrained idea that a boy, since it's the one that provides, needs to uh, be more educated. If family has less resources, they should definitely go to the boy. All of, of some of these ingrained ideas that we need to start changing because uh, why should we base ourselves uh, for example, when, when a family does have to make that difficult decision of like devoting more resources to, to one of their offspring in related to education, because that happens, poverty exists, challenging contexts happen, but why should the basis uh, be, be um, the gender uh, or the sex of, of, of their offspring and not the real capacities or the potential that uh, sometimes we may be hindering if we choose one and not the other, you know, if, if this can be uh, the next um, biggest poet in India or the next uh, greatest engineer or, or, or the greatest mathematician and we are not allowing her to go to school because uh, we have this idea that automatically we should go with the, with the boy. No, we have to slowly challenge and, and change this. So, uh, it is not gender what will make us make all of these decisions, but other considerations, but uh, equality as the first stance for our, for our ethical type of thinking and, and all of these um, uh, stance that we have to take in, in all aspects of life, no? So uh, we, we also fight in general gender stereotypes because this was of course talking about gender stereotypes and, and you saw I was very careful to say uh, poet but also engineer because we we need to mind that like uh, when we talk about gender equality this means breaking all of these stereotypes uh, of course we say that educating a woman is educating a generation because um, they they usually tend to uh, be closer with with uh, in the family etc but we even even that beautiful poem we have to begin to challenge because those stereotypes and issues related to the, the sharing of care, etc., help trace win, women's disempowerment up to the stream and the right source. So right there, sitting on top is the patriarchal structure that regards men as superior. Uh, and many men may disagree to gender-based discrimination, but refuse to speak uh, in fear of losing the dominant status, of course. But again, we need to create spaces for dialogue and for understanding that this is not a zero-sum game. If we achieve gender equality, it doesn't mean uh, losing power on the one hand. It means ending violence, ending oppression, ending this nonsense hindering of the capacities uh, of half of us just because of uh, something as random as whether we were born man or woman. So, or, or else. So this is why gender equality is not only a woman's issue. It's an issue that needs to be dealt with collectively in order to, to break the ground, to break all of those glass ceilings that are all over uh, our societies. And, um, and that's, uh, that's very, very important to, to keep uh, addressing. Absolutely, and I think uh, very wonderfully said that uh, you know there are all of these aspects that need to be looked at, and and I think what I loved the most uh, was the fact that it's not about equality at all. Uh, nobody is equal, and that that's one reality. If we uh, if we face and uh, if we stick to, I think we'll move uh, in a much better space because everyone is different, and it's not just the gender that plays the role. It's there are so many other social, financial, economic, cultural, other factors that also come into play. So every human being is unique. And I think that's, that's the key.
key takeaway and i think as i was listening to you uh, it was wonderful to see you know the sheer passion that you have for the for the kind of work that you're doing and um, mm. i'm sure it must be so much satisfaction to see that you know the boys that you're training uh, or you know the the discussions or the discourse that's happening with them eventually they are coming from one stance they are moving to another where you know they feel that their sisters uh, should also get the same kind of education um so i think it's just beautiful to uh, know all of this and and i think yes. i'm going to yeah thank you shivangi yes i mean again just to emphasize we are in, we, uh, women and men and like no one is equal to one another what we what we mean when we say to gender equality is equality in opportunities equality in in freedom of choices equality on ac access to develop our capabilities and to be counted as capable of like no more and no less than than the other uh, equality in terms of our agency and power to to decide on our our, our knowledge and, and lives and of course and most importantly equality in treatment as citizens not equality no one is equal to one another but if, when we use the word equality it's about all of these aspects that i just mentioned but when we talk about um, the needs of women and men that's when the equity perspective comes in because we need to cater and address the the specific needs of women and men just like we need to address the specific needs of anyone in a given context with this intersectional approach yes absolutely thank you thank you so much uh, one for bringing in all of this uh, uh, discussion today i am sure that the audience will uh, really gain a lot from this and it's also a wonderful feeling to just see the amount of work that's happening and the fact that uh, we are involving the youth as well uh, because again as i said earlier the future depends on them so thank you so much for today thank you very much shivangi and again i invite anyone who will who will be uh, looking at this uh, very interesting conversation we just had to learn about the sustainable development goals the 2030 agenda and particularly the aspirations of goal number 5 on gender equality because that is a society that we all should be working to achieve yes thank you thank you so much for that in fact um, what i'm going to also do is in the youtube description we'll put this goal as well in case somebody wants to refer to it as a quick reference that's We're fantastic that. thank you so much shivanji thank again, you thank you so much thank you on this uh, wonderful initiative of of using your large network to to send out uh, uh, all of these messages and all of this information i really appreciate the invitation thank you thank you so much ma'am